you for the amazing 2021 Widderlead Art Prize Award Ceremony. My name is Marley and I am a Policy and Project Officer at Women with Disabilities Australia. Before we start, I'd like to start with some quick housekeeping. So for tonight's webinar, you'll see that there are a few different options for viewing and listening. You will see at times that we have different screen options. One is a closed caption option. If you like, you can click on this and this can be your main viewing screen. If you click on the speaker view screen, then this will be your main viewing screen. On the main viewing screen, we also have an Auslan interpreter. So if you require this, you can make the Auslan screen bigger by clicking on the interpreter. If you click on the star icon at the side of the screen, this should take you back to the all screen view. If at any stage you have a question or need live support with any of these features, please click on the information icon in the bottom left hand corner for assistance. Beside that icon is a speech bubble icon for you to ask any questions you may have for our judges and winners tonight during our Q&A at the end of the award ceremony. Please just remember you can send through questions anytime and we will be answering these later on. This evening's webcast is being recorded and in the unlikely event that technical issues arise, although we are in lockdown, so <laughs> anything could happen, it will be available to view later today using the same link. Now, I would like to introduce Ani Yvonne Weldon from the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council to give our welcome to country this evening. Thanks, Ani Yvonne. Thank you, Marley. Thank you, Marley. Good evening, everyone. As was said, my name is Yvonne Weldon. I am a sovereign. Wiradjuri woman. I come from Cowra here in New South Wales. I'm from the waters of the Clare, which is also known as the Lachlan, and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I am the elected chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, who are the culture authority under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the land that I'm on. I would like to pay my respects to all elders past and present, to all First Nations Welcome to country is an age-old tradition. It is more than just words, it is a spiritual process by honouring the ancestors' footsteps we are all walking in, continuing the practice of the generations before us to the many generations to come. Our boundaries are written into the earth's natural landscapes. The boundaries of the Aura are the Hawkes River in the north, the Nepean in the west, and the Georges River in the south. On behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, the elders and the members, I welcome everyone to the lands of the Gadigal. I acknowledge the Gadigal people and the people of the lands that you are on, whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with these lands, our Mother Earth. Across this beautiful continent of ours, we represent hundreds of nations, tribes and clans that have existed here for over 60,000 years. My people are the oldest living culture of the world. And as we're all joined online tonight, let us all remember and acknowledge the many warriors that created pathways for all of us, the ones recognised and the ones we've never heard of. My people have always listened and learned from each other, the environment, animals, elements and our ancestors. We don't live in isolation of body, culture, spirit, land and water because we are one. We need to reflect upon the footsteps we're leaving to know where we're heading, shaping a society, a country we can be proud of. Traditionally, Aboriginal people lived our art through our engravings, our paintings, dance, song and spoken words, originally for our families and our clans. Now it's done through many different mediums, on canvas, on screens and so much more. As we move through the changes from our world to yours to become ours together, it's important to keep art alive, not just because it should be seen, but letting the creativity enrich us in ways that our souls need it. And in these times, this pandemic, don't let the social distance make us socially absent. We need to maintain our physical distancing, but not creating barriers to our social connections. So whether it's through your artwork or your networks, creating an inclusion, an acceptance and a resilience. All of us together can bring about positive changes to multiple generations because we are in this together. And as we ponder over important milestones and points of change in our lives and our world, 
think about the difference you are making today that will become the milestones of our future. Through your nominations of these awards or through your continual connection to each and every one of us. So let us all draw upon my people's spirits as we continue on our journey. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we strive forward for us all. Again, on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, welcome to Gadigal Land. This always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Congratulations on sharing your deadly art. Your talents speak to us and for us through your creative language. And I'm so proud of you. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Anne Yvonne. We're always so grateful to have you join us for our Widow Lead webinars. Um, thank and thank you again too for the big congratulations to all the winners that we'll be announcing tonight. Um, like Anne Yvonne said, I think it is a great observation that, you know, during what is a very challenging time for our community as disabled people, and in particular as disabled women and non-binary folks, um, having art to hold on to as a form of connection during a very big period of isolation is very important. So we're just very happy that we got to facilitate um, the Widow Lead Art Prize during what has undoubtedly been a very chaotic year. Um, so I would like to acknowledge that I'm presenting tonight from Ngunnawal and Ambri land, and I pay my respects to the elders and ancestors of this country. Um, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, before I dive into everything, I also would like to give a little visual description of what I look like. So tonight I am wearing a pink jumper. I'm wearing some beautiful dark pink and light pink woven hoop earrings. I have pale skin. I am wearing wireframe glasses and I have shoulder length brown hair. So I know everyone is here tonight to hear about our wonderful winners. Um, but before we dive in, I thought I would just give everyone an overview of how the art prize came to be, as well as how the Widow Lead program came to be. So in 2020, Women with Disabilities Australia received an Information Linkages and Capacity Building Grant, otherwise known as an ILC grant, from the Department of Social Services to develop the leadership and capacity of women and girls with disability. Wida called this project LEAD, which stands for Lead, Engage, Activate and Drive. As part of the project, um, we listened to our community and we knew that members wanted an opportunity to showcase their art, um, acknowledging that a lot of the time art competitions um, and in particular exhibitions aren't accessible for our community. So on International Women's Day, we launched the Widow Lead Art Prize. We wanted to encourage our community of women, girls, feminine identifying and non-binary people to submit their artwork on the theme, we can all be leaders in a variety of accessible and creative formats. Um, we are so pleased to announce that we had an overwhelming response. Um, we received over 112 entries from all states and territories across the country, including regional, remote and rural areas. So without further ado, I will introduce our wonderful judge, Larissa McFarlane, to introduce um, our highly commended entrants as well as announce the runner-up and winner of the over 18s category. So Larissa McFarlane is a visual artist and disability activist based in Nam, otherwise known as Melbourne, on the lands of the Kulin Nation. They work across a printmaking, street art and a community art practice. She identifies as a proud queer disabled artist using she and they pronouns and uses their experience of a 22 year old brain injury to investigate disabled culture, community, identity, and pride. Larissa is also informed by the fast changing urban industrial landscapes of Melbourne's West to investigate ideas of belonging, place, healing, and change. Larissa currently sits on the board of Arts Access Australia, as well as on several arts and disability advisory committees, speaks on panels, and occasionally delivers arts workshops and self-advocacy training. We are really excited to have Larissa here tonight so I will hand over to Larissa.
think you may be on mute, Larissa. Hello. <laughs> yes, I was on mute. Great start. Um, I'm just going to start by visually describing myself. I am a white woman um, with a uh, wearing pink and a colourful headband um, with some with my dreadlocks trying to stick out the top, which are getting lost in the blurred background. And I'm also wearing some prescription glasses that um, look like sunglasses and a colourful scarf. I am on coming to you from the lands of the Bunurong people. Um, who are one of the five clans of the Great Kulin Nation, which is where Melbourne, the country that Melbourne is on. And I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I also want to give thanks to um, the disabled activists and self-advocates um, who have um, fought for the rights of disabled people over years and generations who have led to us being here today and me being here today. And especially um, I've been looking into the, the disabled women of the 90s, 1970s and 80s in Australia and some amazing women that led to the formation of Women with Disabilities Australia. Um, I also really want to thank um, WIDA for initiating this inaugural award and, and also all the staff at WIDA, especially Marley, um, for all their hard work. Um, it's a online and especially during COVID. Um, and I also want to thank Wida for acknowledging the role of art in the lives of disabled people and, and the role of art in disability activism. Um, as um, Thanks for that great intro. I hardly need to say anything, um, except that uh, as a visual artist and also as a disability activist, um, I obviously the art plays a really important part in my work. Um, and yeah, I've been working with my community here in Melbourne, in um, um, with self advocates, particularly in the self advocacy community for the last two decades. And a lot of my work has been around in the it more recently has been exploring disability pride um, because I see that uh, disability pride is our greatest weapon against ableism. But I'm really interested in using the language of disability and, um, and disabled because it gives us power and not just gives us power, it also enables us to connect with our community and connect with our culture um, because disability culture is a real thing and it's a big thing and it's deep and it's endless and it's a great thing to explore. And we can do that when we identify and we um, start thinking about disability pride. So that's why I really want to say I am so proud of all the women and girls and non-binary folks who have entered this art prize because um, I want to thank you for showing your pride and for exploring your disability and the way disability works in your life and your community and um, thank you. And look, there's so many amazing artworks, all the work, artworks are amazing. Um, it's been quite a job as a judge <laughs> As Marley said, there was over a um, hundred entries and um, it's been an absolute honour to be a judge of this award. And, um, and I also an honour to share the judging with um, my sister judge, Fiona Hamilton, such an amazing honour, and also um, with Malika as well for a short time. Um, the, yeah, the judging process was um, quite extensive. And uh, we had um, three main criteria, which I'll share with you, um, that we used to look at each work and judge that. And um, the first criteria was creativity and originality. The second was the interpretation of the theme. And as Marley said, the theme is we can all be leaders. And the third criteria was um, 
a combination of the quality of artistic composition, the overall design and the overall comp um, impression. And we had quite a task. Um, so now I want to announce um, the highly commended. Um, I'm going to run through these quite quickly and we don't have images for these work, but I encourage you to go and look at the website and, um, and check these out. And I just want to say congratulations to all these um, highly commended winners. So in no particular order, Rebecca Newell for her work Leading Together, Casey Gray for Desert Dive. Well, this is really hard because I want to make comments about all of them, but we don't have the time right now. Um, Ferris Knight for A Seat at the Table, Elizabeth Meldrum for The Ballerina, Fiona McIntosh for You Shape Us, Taki Sims for Behind the Mask, Anna Angel for Meet Me at the Gates, and Kim Simpson for Life Isn't Always in Black and White. And now I would like to announce the second prize for the over 18s. And this goes to Tracy McGeehan, for my way. I'm not sure if we get a slide for that, but um, I just want congratulations, Tracy. This work was, um, we both really loved this small painting. Um, it depicts two uh, disabled children um, and an apple tree. And one is climbing the tree with their uh, walking crutches at the base of the tree. And another is supporting um, the other child is supporting the first child in their wheelchair. And we just love the simplicity of this artwork and the way it depicts joy and hope and possibility. And uh, it very much addresses the theme and we really appreciated the words that Tracy has written as well. And for me, I really felt that it demonstrates that leadership doesn't have to be in a hierarchy and that leadership works best when we work together. And the winner, the grand winner of the um, of this inaugural art prize, goes to Marla Bishop and Sam Macon for their work Beyond Invisibility. Congratulations! This is a beautiful artwork. It's strong and it's proud. We love the creative use of flowers in the model. And, and what makes this really so strong is the, the use of the hand-drawn element in combination with the more precise medium of photography. And this, this combination or juxtaposition, to be fancy, um, it, it really sort of identifies the ways that certain experiences and identities are often hidden. And this work effectively gives a presence to those invisible stories. So huge congratulations to Marla and Sam. And Amazing. I think with that, I'm going to pass on to the next person, which I think is Marla. Hello, it is me again. <laughs> 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 Full you, no. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Larissa, for announcing those wonderful winners. And I'm very pleased to share that we have Marla Bishop here tonight to speak to us a little bit about their practice and artwork. So Marla Bishop is an agender disabled fine art photographer based in Perth, Western Australia. Marla aims to celebrate the voiceless through their artwork. They work with people from the LGBTQIA plus community to produce inclusive and collaborative work to promote visibility and awareness of those who are marginalised within society. Marla's work also stems into plus-sized and disabled models in order to give opportunities to those who may not receive them to become a work of art and have their stories told in a visually expressive way. The purpose of their art 
is to allow people from marginal authentically. So it's my absolute pleasure to hand over to Marla, our overall winner for the over 18s category of the Widow Lead Art Prize. Has it changed or am I just not? Here yeah, I am. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, just a quick image description. I am a white person with a very curly copper mullet right now. Um, my eyebrows and eyelashes are painted white and I have a ridiculous amount of blush on and I'm wearing a very frilly white um, floral dress. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm calling in right now from Wadjuk Noongar land in Western Australia. And I'll also be speaking on behalf of the Adelaide artist who goes by Sam as their art alias, but their real name is Frankie Mackin, who resides in Ghana in Adelaide. So um, we did talk a little bit about my description, but also with the help of Frankie, we're now starting the journey into the realm of mixed medium portraiture. And Frankie has written a little bit about themselves. They've said, I'm a chronically ill, agender, 2D generalist artist from Adelaide, working in a range of traditional and digital media. I met Marla through connecting at the Rainbow Calendar Exhibition, a photography competition solely for LGBTQIA plus artists, where Marla won first prize and flew over to receive in Adelaide. I'm the ongoing graphic designer for the calendar, and we will both be judges in this year's competition. I also have an artist statement from both of us, which will probably take up most of my time because there are so many words. Um, so we'll start with my perspective for the photograph element because Frankie did the um, illustrative element. So um, it was basically about my fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia, like many chronic illnesses slash disabilities, are not taken seriously due to their invisibility. Research shows us that 90% of disabilities are invisible, and while their severity is starting to be recognised by society, prejudices still remain. Through my photographic art and the illustrative works of chronically ill, agender, Adelaide artist Frankie Mackin, I would like to validate the struggles of those who live with invisible illnesses to break through the historical ignorance of the medical system and promote awareness. And from Frankie's perspective, um, Marla and I have a shared history of chronic pain and know the struggles of being a young, healthy appearing person in society. I wanted my illustration to portray the anxiety, fear and pain that hide, hides behind the well-constructed social mask we wear on a daily basis. They've also gone into the intricacies of the work because there are quite a few different faces and poses and everything like that. So it was quite interesting to actually hear what they um, used to express it because it was done quite quickly. So the heart, the anxiety and the pain both cause palpitations. All I can feel, all I can focus on is the feeling of my heart beating in my chest, my head, in whatever joint has thrown itself today. It's all encompassing, echoes through my bones, makes focusing on anything external so hard. That leads on to the blindfolded figure, unable to see anything beyond their own self. It gives a sense of derealization. Sorry, to try and escape from the pain. Like, is this my body? Is this all it is? Heads holding the face, feeling it, making sure you're still present in your own skin. The screaming crying is pretty obvious. 100% what you feel like doing at all times during a flare up, but can't. The feeling of looking at a kid screaming in public and being like, damn, I wish it was acceptable for me to do that before taking the red seat on the train and getting an earful from an able-bodied person for taking a spot from a real disabled person you're just trying to get home. The cutout and draw over of Marla's face is emphasizing the mask. This isn't what's real. This is there for the public face, for everyone's expectations. So I'd just like to sign off by thanking you so much for choosing our artwork as the overall winner in the over 18s category. We're absolutely honoured and love that this piece has been recognised by an organisation that celebrates disabled artists and can only hope that this opportunity opens more doors to take up space in the artistic world with our disability advocacy artworks. So, 
that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marla. That was beautiful. And I really appreciated hearing more about your work. And um, as a fellow chronically ill person, I can totally relate to, you know, the internal monologue and, and struggle that you have with um, physically being disabled by pain and illness, but um, not, I guess, visibly presenting that way and not having that pain and illness acknowledged. So it's wonderful to, um, yeah, have, have those feelings validated and expressed in artwork like yours. So I think I will pass on to another one of our amazing judges to announce the runner-up and winner of our under-18s category. So Fiona Hamilton is a Trulwoy woman of the Tasmanian Aboriginal First Nations people, a respected advocate for Aboriginal women in economic development, arts, family violence prevention, cultural heritage management and public policy spaces. Fiona works with Aboriginal communities across Australia at a senior level. We are so lucky to have Fiona here with us tonight. So I will pass on to the wonderful Fiona. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, everyone, what an honour to be here. Uh, my name's Fiona Hamilton. Uh, I am uh, coming to you live and deadly from uh, my lands in uh, Lutrawitha, Trawana. Um, as Marley said, with that wonderful warm welcome, I'm a Trollwulwai woman uh, and uh, always will, always was, always will be our lands. Um, I want to uh, pay my respect to any First Nations people watching tonight from across our lands all around this country. And I want to just give a brief description of what I am wearing tonight. I'm wearing a black top. I am a fair skinned Aboriginal woman. I have long kind of wonky, <laughs> wavy, <laughs> crazy brown hair. And uh, I am wearing um, black rimmed glasses and a very long uh, traditional Tasmanian Aboriginal shell necklace made of white shells, black shells, and iridescent uh, purple and green shells. Uh, I want to say what an absolute honour it is. And um, I wanted to thank uh, Larissa, who um, gave just a wonderful, um, I, I guess, entrance into, um, you know, really what this art award is all about and how critical it is for, in particular, our young artists to have opportunities and supported opportunities to not just have a voice, but to make work and to present work and to not just talk about, but talk to the world around us. Um, I've been making art for gee, it'd have to be 30 years. And I've been doing that in all sorts of ways. Um, sometimes I'm making my own work. Um, and that incorporates a lot of, you know, traditional Tasmanian Aboriginal practices that I like to kind of turn on their head and use in new ways. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm writing, sometimes I'm culturally producing, and sometimes I'm working with remote Aboriginal art centres in particular to support other artists to make their work. Um, and within those art centres, um, I've had the honour and privilege to work with um, many of the country's best um, First Nations artists. Um, and, uh, you know, I when I reflect on the diversity of artists and particularly First Nations artists that I've had the honour to work with. It's a very humbling um, experience. And I guess I can only liken that really to what a humbling experience it's been to, um, you know, work uh, with the other judges uh, to try and select winners from what is just a stellar array of artwork that's been submitted for this art prize. For an inaugural art prize, it's um, you know, quite overwhelming, really, to see how many people have entered. Have we swapped out? No, we're still going? Still going. Okay. Um, 
I just wanted to talk a little bit about pathway for young artists before I get to um, announcing our runner-up and our winner of the um, under-18s category. When I was young, as a, a neurodivergent um, young woman, one of the ways that I found to be able to give voice to the things that I felt that I could see and notice about the world that nobody else seemed to was to make art. And that made it all right. And it made it all right to be different and to be an outsider and to sometimes have people kind of look at you a little, <laughs> a little strangely whenever you open your mouth and talk about the things that sometimes other people won't talk about. Um, and as I made more art, I felt better about myself and I felt better about moving through the world and I felt stronger and I felt like I had a voice. And as I've become older and my practice as an artist has developed, I realised that we have to make it easier for young people to make art and we have to make it easier for young women and young non-binary people to uh, have access to opportunities to make art and to have valuable platforms like this. So I just want to really thank WIDA for um, really instigating um, this art award. It's incredibly important and I really hope it continues in the future. Um, and without further ado, I guess I'd like to announce our runner up in the, you know, under 18s category. So exciting. So our runner up is Madeline Lowe for her just staggering artwork, um, Invisible Battles, which is such a beautiful, clear, concise and vibrant work. Um, and uh, Larissa and I just fell in love with this artwork and we were like, we're not worthy. <laughs> um, it really just is such a delightful, um, strong and very well articulated artwork. The medium is beautiful, the use of colour is beautiful and, um, you know, um, Madeline, we're extremely proud of you. on about whether I can buy it. Um, and uh, our winner tonight, uh, yeah, this was so tough. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a bit of a suspenseful moment. This was so, so tough um, to choose between these two artworks. But um, our winner tonight is Leading with Vision by Genevieve Moheran. Um, I thought I mean, I'm sure that Larissa has other thoughts about this artwork, but I thought, you know, the artist's statement about this work was just so beautifully articulated to the theme. Um, and it just really captured that idea that leadership is about differing perspectives and about, um, you know, kind of seeing the world continually from, you know, different, different positions and different perspectives. And I loved, um, you know, the idea of using different styles and mediums in one work. It was just beautiful. So congratulations to uh, Madeline Lowe for Invisible Battles as our runner up and uh, Genevieve Moheran as our winner for Leading with Vision. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. And what a pleasure it has been to have you as one of our judges. Um, I looked at all the entries and I just could not have judged this category. It was too amazing. Um, unfortunately, Genevieve can't be here with us tonight, but it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our runner-up of the under age artist living with Tourette's syndrome, ADHD, OCD, trichotillomania and PTSD. Madeline has always had a passion for creating art and telling stories, a desire to share her ideas with the world being one of Madeline's main inspirations in life. Madeline enjoys animating, creating digital art and watercolour paintings. She lives in Tasmania 
with her loving family and pet frogs. So I will hand over to Madeline. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Fiona. Um, you're a lovely judge and I really appreciate your kind words about my artwork. It really means a lot. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the native Aboriginal people, past, present and future. I'll just do a quick audio description. Um, I'm a fair skinned woman with long brown hair and I'm wearing a multicolored um, t-shirt with diamonds and stripes on it. Um, so a bit about me, I'm currently being homeschooled, which has significantly helped me with um, my learning disabilities. And it's far easier for me to concentrate because um, it's very difficult with my ADHD when there's lots with people. I've now got really good friends who um, are nice and not judgmental about my Tourette's <laughs> and other things. Um, I've also got a lot more time to work on projects that I'm very passionate about. And ever since I could hold a pencil incorrectly, I've had a passion for expressing my thoughts and feelings through the medium of art. And I enjoy writing stories and creating animations. Um, recently, I've written a novel called Planet Altera. Um, I've got it with me right now. It's got, um, it's very shiny. It's got this blue character who's a fish with purple tentacles. It's a bit hard to see, but there's a very dark green. It's like a shadow, the shadow of a cat. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed doing the artwork for it. And I also wrote the book with my friend Layla. We both have ADHD, so we could help each other. Um, if one of us got distracted or ran out of steam, we'd switch our devices and work on different chapters. Um, so we've self-published Planet Altera and proven that it doesn't matter if you have disadvantages, everybody can create something beautiful from the heart and we can help each other. We can help our friends overcome our daily battles. Um, as well as me and my sister, my mum also struggles with invisible internal battles. She has to deal with them every day, but that never stops her from being a, a loving, strong, single parent who takes care of two children with special needs. Um, she means the world to me and my sister. So when I heard that the Women with Disabilities Australia organisation was doing an art contest, I instantly knew who I was going to draw. Uh, when people hear the word disability, our mind tends to go towards the more obvious disabilities that we can see. But most of my friends and a lot of my family have invisible um, daily struggles. Um, so my art piece is titled Invisible Battles. And it's a drawing of my mum and the colour of the flowers represent her different um, internal disabilities. And this piece is dedicated not only to my mum, but to everyone who has their own daily invisible struggles. Just a reminder that you are powerful and you are loved. Thank you.
Hello everyone. Welcome back from that short break. We hope it gave you the opportunity to go to the toilet or maybe get a cuppa. Um, but most importantly, to get a taste of all the amazing entries that we received as part of the Wittelead Art Prize this year. Um, as you can see, there were drawings, there was acrylic paintings, videos, photography. Um, I'm just astounded by the level of talent within our community. Um, and also very sad <laughs> that I do not seem to be talented in any of these aspects. <laughs> but I will now pass over to a very special guest um, who is um, an expert in this field, I guess, of accessible arts um, and was very kind enough to donate a prize for our People's Choice Awards winner. So Liz Martin is one of New South Wales' leading specialists in disability-related access and inclusion for the arts and cultural sector and has over 20 years of experience working within the arts and disability sector as a musician, producer, trainer, and advocate. Liz currently works as Accessible Arts Arts Development and Training Manager. And in this role, Liz provides training and consulting services to a broad range of arts organizations across New South Wales, from major companies such as Sydney Festival, Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, and Sydney Biennial, to small independent operators. Liz is also Deputy Chair of Arts Access Australia, a member of Sydney Festival's Access and Inclusion Advisory Panel, and an active leader within the arts and disability community. So it is my absolute pleasure to hand over to Liz to tell us a little bit more about Accessible Arts New South Wales, and also introduce and announce the runner-up and winner of our People's Choice Award category. Hello, everyone. I'm dialing in from Gadigal land of the Eora Nation and would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, mm, what can I tell you? I have a overgrown um, uh, haircut, like a, like, a, like a mullet, I guess you would say. Um, I'm wearing a large um, fluffy blue scarf and a blue sweatshirt and sitting in lockdown in my small flat in Sydney. Um, my name is Liz Martin. I'm the Arts Development and Training Manager at Accessible Arts. I'm also a musician and a huge lover of all things arts and culture. I also identify as a queer person with disability. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Marley and the wonderful team at WWDA for inviting Accessible Arts to be involved today. Um, if you don't know us, Accessible Arts is the peak arts and disability organisation in New South Wales. We were established in 1986. We work with and for our community to accelerate and celebrate the diverse professional, cultural and social impacts of arts and disability in New South Wales. Our mission is to advance the rights of and opportunities for people with disability and or who are deaf to develop and sustain professional careers in the arts and have equitable access to arts and culture across New South Wales. Our vision is equity and excellence in arts, culture and disability. We provide a range of programs and services which focus on career advancement, audience development and community engagement for arts practitioners and audiences with disability, including things like creative initiatives, internships, mentorships and artist residencies, professional development workshops, leadership development programs, industry education and advocacy, community and industry forums, networking events and advisory services. We know through research done by Australia Council for the Arts, artists with disability earn on average 42% less than artists without disability. We're doing everything we can to create uh, an equal playing field for artists and audiences with disability. If you haven't come across Accessible Arts before, or even if you know of us, you've heard of us, please check out our website, follow us on social media platforms, 
keep track of what we're doing, what we're up to, what opportunities there might be for you to join one of our programs or get involved with their with accessible arts. We're a super small team, but we're very friendly and keen to connect. Um, so yeah, do get in touch. Um, it's our great honor today to be sponsoring the People's Choice Award. Um, it's, it's a prize that's close to my heart. Um, it's uh, the winner of the prize of the People's Choice Award will be eligible for up to $300 worth of training, which can be used to um, complete our training packages, which include uh, disability competence training, our accessible, uh, being accessible online training, and our accessible marketing and communications training. Each of the training packages have a very arts solutions um, focus. So um, there's loads of opportunities for really practical learning in that space. So uh, it is my absolute pleasure to announce the runner up for the People's Choice Award for their work, Lady 1955, a huge congratulations to Rebecca Southam. And now it is my honor to announce the People's Choice winner for their work, Rainbow Rosetta. A massive congratulations to Leonie Donahue. I will now pass over to Marley. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And thank you again to Accessible Arts for your very generous sponsorship and donation. I'm sure Leonie will um, very much enjoy the trainings that they'll be able to access now. So I will pass over to the wonderful Leonie Donahue, who is here to join us tonight. Leonie was diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis in 2017 after 20 years of misdiagnosis. Due to being immunosuppressed, Leonie doesn't leave the house a great deal and has a huge amount of free time. Leonie started crocheting around 15 months ago to help her manage her pain and to also help keep dexterity in her hands. And I must say for someone who only started crocheting 15 months ago, Rainbow Rosetta is an incredible piece of art. So I will pass over to Leonie. I think you're on mute, Leonie. <laughs> See, um, I always say to everybody, I'm a little bit special, so you've got to be, um, just be tolerant with me because it takes me a little while to get the hang of things. Um, thank you, everybody, for that. Um, I, I um, would like to give a visual of my appearance. I have a short silver hair and I've um, got black glasses on and I've got a green shirt on. Um, and I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. Um, I, I'm really, really thankful for everybody that um, went out of their way to, to uh, vote for me. Um, um, it's been a, a hard journey. It's a hard journey for people living with um, disabilities. It doesn't matter what your disability is, but it's it's definitely a hard journey for for all of us that do live with disabilities. Um, I found that I needed something to help me manage my pain. I do live with chronic pain, um, also due to fibromyalgia. I have chronic pain in both hands and both feet. I'm very limited with um, what I can and what I can't do. Um, so I, I decided. Um, to start up crocheting because I thought that would help me with my hand, uh, the pain in my hands. Um, and I picked it up quite quickly. Um, the Rosetta Cal is uh, something that I made. Uh, it shows the dark side of, of my disability and also the light side of my disability. Uh, so it is, uh, there is black and then it is very colourful. It's a big colourful flower. It's like someone coming out of themselves, a flower which shows me coming out of, of, you know, living the way that I have to live with chronic pain and, and this disability. Um, 
and also it also reminds um, people of a glass stained window in, in, in a church. That's what it looks like. Um, it took me around six weeks uh, to do the um, Rosetta Cow. And I did it all day, every day. It's um, now become a bit of an addiction, unfortunately, crochet. It's um, something I do from the time I wake up till the time I lay my head on the pillow. Um, but it also helps me um, bring happiness to other people. I, I don't do it to sell it. I actually do it to give away as gifts to people that I love. So every blanket and every... A piece of artwork that I do is different. None, none are the same, and it, it brings happiness to other people. And when I bring happiness to other people, it in turn brings me happiness. Um, it's been a long journey, but I'm I'm really grateful to be here today. And I, I want to say thanks to everybody that's put uh, this together. Um, it's first. It's the first art show I've actually um, ever entered. All my family have been on my back for about 12 months. You should enter that. You should enter that. What is wrong with you? Put it into the, you know, the Easter show. Or I'm like, well, I don't know how to do those things. But I, I, I was on uh, Facebook and I come across uh, Women WWDA and I was like, oh, my God, I think I was meant to put my artwork in this show. How fantastic is this? I can actually find like-minded women that understand the daily struggles that we go through and, and how art can we can express ourselves by doing this art and also bring happiness to other people. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for everybody that has put this together. I'm grateful uh, for, um, you know, people that voted um, and also all the judges and thank you very much for everything thank you thank you leone and we are yeah so so happy that you have um found the widow community and you know found a community of like-minded people and i think that is exactly what we want disabled women feminine identifying and non-binary folks to express themselves through art um, and have, you know, the community around us understand and relate and most importantly, I think, feel validated by, you know, the leadership of other, other people in our community. So um, that concludes the announcement section of this evening's webinar. Um, but we are really excited to now transition into a Q&A with all of our wonderful winners as well as our wonderful judges. Um, so I will invite Fiona, Larissa, Marla, Leone, and Madeline, as well as the wonderful Liz Martin to join me now for a wonderful Q&A. Um, and as a reminder, um, beside um, the little information icon at the bottom of your screen, there is a speech bubble icon for you to ask any questions you may have for our judges and winners tonight during our Q&A. Um, rest assured, I will get them and we have more than enough time to ask and find out more about these incredible people's art practice. Um, so I think to kick us off, I wanted to ask you, Marla, how does art allow you to express yourself differently I guess, to speaking in words or written language? Um, I would say being able to visually express how I feel was a big part of that um, piece where um, for a lot of my life I've been treated as if um, but I'm not disabled enough because I don't look the way that people perceive disability to be. Um, so it's nice to be able to um, give that opportunity to other people to have their stories told if they've been invalidated or not been listened to or had their voices silenced. Um, I find it's a lot easier for people to relate to the art if they can visually see what another person is experiencing rather than just writing about it. But usually I do get my models to write something to go along with the piece so you have as much context as possible. 
Brilliant. And um, yeah, Leonie, what about you? So you said that, you know, crocheting was for you a very physical activity to try and manage and mitigate pain. Um, and I guess that's something that, you know, you, you didn't use words or language for. How do you think art, I guess, um, allows you to express yourself differently? I think that it's, um, for me, um, you see, I, I, I have over 60 lesions in my brain, so I'm losing my memory uh, much like Alzheimer's, but worse. So for me, I needed um, something that was going to keep my mind aware and alert. And every little stitch with crochet, every single different stitch is, is, can be very intricate, which means that I'm using parts of my brain that I need to, you know, keep going, and not lose it, because I am I am losing my ability to to talk, my ability to think, my ability, and this is this is, you know, some unfortunately what happens with people with primary progressive MS. So I just needed something that was gonna um, help me sort of keep a little bit of that memory going um, and keeping the little tiny stitches, every little stitch is, is a thought. It's me having to think about how I'm going to do that and and how it looks once I'm finished with it all as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. It's such a, you know, a beautiful skill to be born out of pain. Um, mm. And I wish that, yeah, wish that I was a fraction as talented as you, Leo. Um, Look, at the end of the day, I, I've tried everything for pain management. Like I'm I'm permanently on morphine. I'm permanently on morphine. It's my life. I, you know, I'm on a lot of painkillers. And no amount of painkillers will ever, ever get rid of my pain because it's all neurological pain that I get. So I needed, I've tried self-awareness, meditation. I've gone through all of those sorts of things to try and manage my pain. And I just, I haven't, I hadn't found anything that really truly gets rid of it. So I wanted to find something where I had to really concentrate. And that way I'm not always thinking about the pain. I'm thinking about the next stitch I'm going to make. I have to count. Okay, I've just counted 200 stitches. And when I'm counting, I'm not thinking about that pain as much. Mm, absolutely. I can totally understand how that would work. Mm. Um, yeah, Madeline, I guess I wanted to ask you this question too, because we're asking everyone about, you know, how does art allow you to express yourself differently to speaking in words or I guess written language? But I know um, you showed us the wonderful book that you've written with your friend as well. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about you know, how do you feel you express yourself differently in your digital art compared to your writing? Um, well, yeah, it's very hard to form sentences um, to really get across what I'm trying to say. So I like to do it through the medium of storytelling. Um, I take bits and pieces of myself, things that are important to me and experiences and make them like a whimsical journey. And I... I've always loved drawing because I can just express all these bright, you know, nonsensical things that are always happening in my head and put them onto paper and it makes it easier for people to understand what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, I find it hard to express myself, but when I can sit down and I can think of a story, it's very therapeutic and calming to me. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think too that that aspect of storytelling that's across both, you know, written language as well as art is like incredibly important. Um, and I think I wanted to pass over to you, Fiona. Um, how how do you incorporate storytelling into your own artistic practice? Um, storytelling's incredibly important to First Nations people. And it's incredibly important to me. Um, I, in my work, I, I, I don't work well, and I don't think artists often do work well if you don't have something to say, if you're not trying to communicate something. Um, I think, you know, the stories that we need to be, uh, you know, telling of ourselves 
often don't need interpretation through art. And I think that's the beauty and the power of art. Um, for a long time, you know, when I exhibited my work, you know, you'd have one of those like dinky little sort of white cards and it's sort of like, you know, this is a such and such and here's the size of it and this is what it's made out of and here's a little artist statement about what it's about. And I actually stopped doing that. I felt a little time ago because I realised that the only person that the story of my artwork really means anything to is me. What other people see in your artwork is up to them and they might see what you've intended or they may not. Um, but it kind of doesn't matter because the beauty of the story of art is in the dialogue that it creates and in the lasting memory of experiencing it. And that's just so important. Um, so I'm not sure if that um, answers the question, but for me, the message of art is buried and ancient. Absolutely. I think that more than answers the question, Fiona. Um, uh, yeah, I love that idea too of like, you know, what is, what is the dialogue um, being facilitated by the art and the importance of like, you know, having something to say through art. And I think in particular, Larissa, you touched on this earlier as disabled people, you know, art is something that we use as a medium to explore what we have to say as disabled folks. So um, I wanted to ask you for people who might not be aware um, Larissa was one of the main artists and facilitators of a very big um, disability pride mural in Nam in Footscray. Um, Larissa, and I was wondering if you could talk us through that piece of art and, you know, the dialogue that you that you hope and also you saw facilitated through that piece. Sure. Um, yeah, that was a, a big artwork. Um, I'd like to say first that I came to art through my brain injury, which was 22 years ago. So I didn't actually participate in any visual art before that at all. Um, and I just found that words weren't, uh, didn't, weren't easy for me. Um, and so visual art became really important. And um, yeah, I mean, I said before how disability pride is really important to me because I, I want us, I want, I want my friends to the Disability Pride Mural came about because I wanted my friends to join me in, um, in creating a visual representation in public space that showed pride in who we are. And, um, and the, what, what happened, I suppose, was that the, 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 the making of the work and the relationships we built and the um, connecting with each other and the conversations was actually the important bit. Um, and the action of making the work. So my medium is um, paste up in public space, so a form of street art. And it's actually quite simple and accessible. And um, so that's what we did was we held a paste up party and took a whole day to um, people dropping in and out to paste up um, things that were important, images that were important to them onto this wall. So it was sort of a mishmash of, um, of images at the end, but it encapsulated all these relationships along the way. Yeah, and community. And um, it kept going because unfortunately the wall was removed by mistake a week later. So we did it all over again. Um, and hopefully there'll be more in the future. Oh, Larissa, I'm so sorry it was removed, but yes, I. I I'm glad that it's back and that there'll be more in the future. Um, and I guess, would you be able to quickly tell our audience if they wanted to view this work, you know, is there a particular phrase that they should Google um, to see an image or? Um, good question. Um, I think that if you Google disability pride and my name, you would come up with a whole lot of images um, or Footscray because it's located in Footscray in Melbourne, Nam, and um, it's still there. It's a bit faded, but you can actually go and visit it and see it. Brilliant. If I'm ever in Nam, I will absolutely be taking a selfie with it. <laughs> and you have to call me so I can come and meet you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So Liz, I have a few questions for you from the audience. Um, the first one is um, from Cyrus, who is wondering, what would you suggest for those who do not live in metropolitan areas to be able to access mentors in different art mediums? Uh, interesting. Um, you know, two years ago, some things seemed so difficult. Um, and I guess the whole one great thing, one great thing out of this ridiculous time of COVID and restrictions and all the heartache in it is that for some people, not for everyone, but for some people, on the online experience is really great. Um, and it means you can connect with other artists um, and mentors. I'm not sure which state you're in or territory, Cyrus, but I know that, you know, say in Western Australia, um, Dada has a fantastic mentorship program. Um, I'm pretty sure that Arts Access Victoria has a sim similar program. I can see a nod and, and thumbs up from Larissa, so it's true. Um, in New South Wales, we are talking about it right like earlier today and the day before, so we're on our way to establishing one. Um, so I would definitely reach out to your local arts and disability body. And there's one of these in nearly every state in Australia, state and territory. Um, you can have a look at the Accessible Arts website. So if you go aarts, so double a r t s dot net dot au, um, we have a resource page. And on that, you'll find a whole list of all the state orgs that you can contact. And there's also um, Arts Access Australia, who's the national body. Um, you can also get in contact with them and say, hey, I really want to connect. I want to grab a mentor. I want to hook into the arts and disability community and they will help you find your way. Um, it's so wonderful to find other people with disability who have a real passion for the arts and want to make stuff. And it's one of my favourite places on the planet to com com commu communicate with other artists with disability. So there's a whole community out there for you if you've not connected in with um, that you can connect with now. I hope that helps. <laughs> Definitely, Liz. And I think um, a nice segue is that we have another question and I think it kind of touches on what you were saying before, um, you know, about, you know, we are in a, a very um, strange time period for disabled people where, you know, we are being made vulnerable by um, COVID as well as, you know, very immense pressures on our healthcare system. But at the same time, um, there are a lot of accessibility features for us that are being introduced that, you know, our community has been fighting for for years. Um, so Fiona, I wanted to pass on to you for this one first is, do you have any tips or suggestions for how disabled artists can remain connected to the artist community during current times with lockdowns? Oh, yeah, man. Like, absolutely. Like, you know, you just got to reach out to other artists. And, and you know, the beautiful thing about us, Mob, is that we love to talk about our work. By and large, we just love to talk about our work and to exchange ideas and, um, you know, to really encourage, you know, people, especially if you're a bit shy, you know, about your art, um, you know, about those conversations. Um, you know, one of the great things I think um, about social media is, you know, my social media is just chockers full of arts friends um, and all sorts of other people. And those are, you know, all sorts of other people who often go, can you guys stop talking about art? <laughs> um, you know, really, um, you know, yeah, we can live such isolated lives and we can face so many struggles and, you know, I guess I have to caution too that, you know, the art world is, is a tough place. It's full of ableism, you know, it's full of struggles. There's a whole heap of like, you know, gallerists and, and, and you know, institutions that, you know, just kind of still aren't where they need to be um, for us mob. And, 
but they're getting there. And, and, you know, the more that we sort of like bang on those doors and the more that we present our voice and we present our art and that we have those dialogues within our, uh, you know, our disability community um, and, you know, kind of hook up um, and discuss ideas and discuss collaborations because I think, you know, there's so much strength for us in collaborations um, as well. It's a really beautiful way to make work and to exchange ideas and to create really complex sort of multi-layered dialogue. Um, you know, the more powerful our sector is going to get because that's what we are. We're an art sector um, and a really important um, um, and, 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 and powerful one and growing more powerful every day. Um, but I think, you know, ab absolutely, you know, the best way I reckon is to just make something and show it to someone. That's how you start an art dialogue. Absolutely. And Fiona, I think, um, yeah, that leads in beautifully to a question that, that we have about, you know, I guess the process of being seen as an artist. So Sandra has said that um, I'm legally blind and I had my first exhibition earlier on this year. Congratulations, Sandra. Um, and I've been painting for a year and a half now. So my question is, how do you break the ice of people seeing you as a person with a disability rather than just seeing an artist? Um, so, Leonie, I wanted to pass this on to you. How, how have you experienced, you know, considering yourself not only as a disabled person with MS, um, but also as a brilliant artist? Like, would you, would you call yourself an artist? I definitely would. Um, you know, I know some people don't see crochet as, as an art, but you can definitely make it as an, as an art. I, I like doing graph gains, which is what, that Rosetta Cow was. So I can make any image into a blanket, any image you give to me, I can make it into a blanket. Um, you know, art is what you make it. You can turn anything into art as long as that's, you know, you've got that artistic flair to be able to, to do that. Um, and I've always been an artistic person. I've always, art was the only subject at school I got an A for, I can tell you that. But um, it's, it's, it, it, I think people can look past the disability. I know not everybody can, but many people that, that actually appreciate art can look past your disability. They see the art and the beauty in what you do. Yeah, thank you, Leonie. Um, Marla, I'd be interested to hear your take on this question because I know, um, through your artist statement and your artist bio that um, in particular, you know, you've wanted people to acknowledge you as specifically a disabled artist um, and kind of look at the way that your work is informed by disability. So I guess, yeah, how, how do you break the ice of people seeing you as a person with a disability rather than just seeing an artist? Um, it's always been quite difficult just because I don't look the way that people perceive disability to look. So I'm often pushed to do more things if I get commissions. Um, I'm expected to do a lot more because I'm quite good at articulating myself. Um, I manage everything. Um, I sometimes I have to tell people and remind them that I'm a disabled person. I can't do everything that they want me to do. Um, I'm on the disability support pension, so I can't pay for everything they want me to do as well. Um, and it's, it seems like it's always a shock to them as well. And it's quite frustrating because it is quite a big part of who I am um, and my life experience. And all I really can do is help other people be seen through my work and um, be shown in a way that's authentic to them. And um, they don't really have to keep saying it over and over again. They've just got a picture and you can say, this is me. So um, that's really, Hopefully that answered the question, but yeah. I hope so. And um, yes, although I'm not an artist, I do consider myself a writer and I, um, you know, I totally experienced that myself in the kind of creative world in which, you know, once you build some sort of small profile as a disabled artist or writer, there are so many demands of you. And I think, you know, a lot of publishers or a lot of galleries kind of forget you know, the limits that we have as disabled artists um, and the need for, I guess, slowness and intention 
in in the practice that um you know we're, we're creating with our art um so madeline i had a few specific questions for you so um one is a funny one <laughs> one is a serious one mm -hmm. um so first of all um the audience wanted to know do you think that having an artist persona lends you a bit of a louder voice in situations where young women and non-binary people with disability are usually silenced and then um, an audience member also wanted to know what are the names of your frogs <laughs> um I'll, I'll do the frog one first um so their names are billy bob cube kermit <laughs> and ralph and they're about this small I love them very much and I, I, I have done some watercolour paintings of them. Um, they're on my drawing desk. So when I'm writing and drawing, I just look at them and they look at me. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's a very mutual respect. <laughs> um, and by artist persona, can you please clarify what you mean by that exactly? Of course. Um, so I guess, would you consider calling yourself an artist? and, you know, being someone who not only writes but creates um, digital art, would you yeah. say that that kind of um, allows you to speak to disability and feel like your voice is heard a bit more than um, if you weren't using art as a medium, especially mm. as a young person? Um, well, actually, for a while, I didn't call myself an artist. I didn't think of myself as much as an artist or an author. Um, because I would put myself down and think that I'm not good enough. But I found that being friends with other people with disabilities who are also artists and being on groups online with people who have similar interests has made me feel more confident in myself. And um, yeah, now I would say that I'm an artist and it's a very big passion and inspiration in my life. And it really helps me cope uh, with my problems, it almost makes them, them feel like they're not there when I'm really in the zone with, with drawing and writing. Brilliant. And I'm, I'm so glad that you consider yourself an artist because you're a brilliant one, as confirmed and attested to by our judges. Um, and I hope um, that all of our Widow Art Prize entrants joining us tonight do consider themselves artists um, because you all are. You're brilliant artists. So Larissa, I wanted to pass over to you for a big question. Um, it might not have easy answers, um, but Casey wanted to know, how can we as a movement start to get the artwork of people who do not have the technical skills to be as valued in mainstream culture as other artworks so that the artist's messages are appreciated and conveyed and enjoyed and included like anyone else's? For instance, maybe a person with intellectual disability who may not have the technical skill but has a message, passion in every other aspect. How do we get those artists included and valued in mainstream arts culture? Um, yeah, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> lots of words. Um, and I'm tiring a lot, but I'm thinking about how one of the things I've done over the years is um, lead little workshops making um, zines. Um, and I've done lots of workshops with people with intellectual disability and cognitive disability, and they are the best at it, um, doing making these little zines. Um, and they make these amazing zines about, because my focus has been around um, making work about your life with disability and what that means to you. And so there isn't a lack of talent or lack of um, skill even. I think the issue is more about the attitudes and discrimination and ableism from the arts um, world that doesn't recognise certain types of art. Um, it's, yeah, it's not about lack of skill. Um, how do we change that? <laughs> um, we keep making art <laughs> and um, and come together, talk about it, I suppose. That's a big question. How do we get rid of ableism? It is a huge question and I knew that it wouldn't have simple answers. Um, 
And as we're wrapping up tonight, Liz, I thought I would hand over to you um, for a final minute or two just to get your views on, you know, as someone who has been working at the cross sections of disability and arts and culture, um, what have you seen in the last, you know, decades of your career um, that has really pioneered the way, you know, to value disabled artists <laughs> as artists, as, you know, brilliant um, creatives, just like anybody else? Uh, I feel like my internet is going a little strange right now. Can you hear me okay, Molly? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, great. Um, excellent. I just wanted to say, actually, um, uh, when you, Larissa, when you were speaking, there's some brilliant artists out there you need to check, not Larissa, but I'm sure you know about them, but everyone else can check out. Um, there were a couple of artists with intellectual disability who were finalists in the Archibald last year, um, Emily Crockford and Digby Webster. Their work is amazing. Emily Crockford's I wish was in my house. If you're curious around this area, I suggest checking out a group called Studio A um, in Sydney and they, th these artists were out of Studio A. They have more finalists this year in this year's Archibald Prize, um, as well as I think it's the Win or the Sulman, one of those um, that happen at the same time. Um, there's so many brilliant artists out there. I'm probably a eternal optimist is probably my problem, but I see that to me, um, when I look at the arts, I feel like it's opening up and there's more and more room gradually being made for different stories and different representation of all types of people on our stages and on the walls and in, our, in the music we make. And that's people with disability. It's also First Nations people. It's also people from different cultural backgrounds. There's space and there's a, an openness in audiences and audiences are starting to um, be more open-minded and learn to be more inclusive in what they're looking at and engaging with. So I just think it's a wonderful time to, um, to make stuff. If you're curious or you make stuff, you can call yourself an artist if you want, or you can call yourself a maker or whatever you want to do. It, just make stuff and get it out there. Show your friends start entering things, connecting with the communities that already exist and, um, and, and enjoy yourselves. That's essentially what it's about. Hey, um, but congratulations to everyone uh, today. What a great, what a great thing this has been. Wonderful. Thank you, Liz. And um, Larissa has popped in our little presenters chat. Thanks, Liz, for your optimism. Lockdown on Ngunnawal and Nambri land, otherwise known as Canberra. And I know Larissa is in lockdown in Nam in Melbourne. Um, and I know a lot of other people are in lockdown in this country. And as disabled people, it's a very scary time. So, you know, having the optimism and joy that art brings has been very, very pivotal. So that wraps up our wonderful inaugural Widow Lead Art Prize and our award ceremony. Thank you to all of our wonderful judges and winners and runners up who have presented tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure to learn more and um, I guess see more about your artistic practice as well. Um, so there will be a link for anybody wanting to re-watch this webinar or share it with your friends and family. And we will be posting that on Witter's social media and emailing that out to all those who registered for tonight's event. Um, and if you're wanting to get more involved with our community, you can join Witter by becoming a member and joining our WIDA community Facebook group. Um, in regards to with what's next for the LEAD project, you can contribute to the WIDA LEAD blog. So maybe you don't consider yourself an artist, but you consider yourself a writer. You can email me at project at .au if you'd like to pitch to the blog. You can check out our new WIDA Youth podcast. You can attend one of our peer networking sessions, which is a great way to interact with other WIDA members and stay tuned for the next date to be announced again on our social media. And then finally, 
stay tuned for some very exciting leadership developments next year, including our leadership toolkit and what will be an amazing virtual leadership summit at the end of 2022. Thank you all for joining us again. And finally, a big congratulations to all of our Witter Lead Art Prize winners and entrants. Bye, everyone.